culinary arts and creativity. How about gardening? That as well. We should see a poll popping up there now. Excellent, perfect, right. The first thing we're gonna look at is how you see. Come on, white screen, I got a little bit more time here. How you see, oh, we've got a scribble on there. Somebody's being creative on our screen. Excellent, that's why we were getting blurbed because somebody was using our screen to demonstrate. How you see, okay, now we gotta catch up, see. C is, comes in a number of different ways. We can see with our eyes, and we bring that in at about 11 megabytes per second. I'm going to give you some numbers here about how we're taking in data. In touch, we take in data into our brain at about one megabyte per second. All right? When we listen, we're bringing in as hearing about 100 kilobytes per second. I know. Some people like numbers. When we smell something, our olfactory system brings it in at about 100 kilobytes per second. And the fifth sense, as you some well know, is taste. And that's the lowest of our data sensory receptors. And that comes in at about one kilobyte per second. Now, here's the thing. There's five senses. And we're bringing in stuff all of the time in all those five senses. But in seeing... We keep getting blocks in here. I'm not quite sure where they're coming from, but we're going to do an activity. Oh, because we're getting blocked, we're losing time here at times. So, for one minute, we're going to. I'm going to show you some visuals. What do you see? That was 74 images in 60 seconds. A lot of images. Now, if I asked you to describe what you saw, maybe the top three things that you saw, not one of you will show something differently. I would not one of you say the same thing. What we're looking for and the last of the greatest C's is understanding how we see things and what we understand them to be or how we interpret them is the real value of C. When we see as a part of our demonstration of what's remembered, what we see and what we project to others makes us our unique perception. Now, how are you going to tell that? How are you going to take what you see and tell that to others? A couple of years ago, I had a protege in a speaking club, and she wanted to give a dance demonstration for her icebreaker. I said, sure, why not? Give a de demonstration. Fatima came in to do her icebreaker and she did this lovely 30 second display of her dancing skills. How you communicate what you understand of the world can be a myriad of different things. There are so many different ways that you can communicate what you see and what you understand. When it comes to what we communicate about what we see, we're really trying to communicate what we understand of the world and how we're understanding our perceptions of it. We can do that in so many different ways, through art, through communication with numbers, through, I mean, how many different ways are there really to communicate your understanding? I, I'm thinking that as the group of people that we have here, if you just communicate in the chat, you're communicating what you understand or what you don't understand. I, I, 
as a kid, I remember being a Saturday morning cartoon kid. And a lot of the things, all the memes that I had in my life came as a result of watching cartoons and Hanna-Barbera. I, those still stick with me. What we understand and how we communicate that out makes us unique. The stories that we tell, they're our experiences. The, the, the way we put together our presentations, the way we put together our speeches makes us unique. We don't want to be copycats because the copycat of, of somebody else's understanding diminishes who we are as an individual. So being able to tell what we communicate, or excuse me, tell what we understand is critical for our uniqueness. How you tell makes you or demonstrates your, uni your uniqueness. You want to make an impression on your audience. And how you're going to do that is the way you tell, your style. And we know that when we're meeting somebody for the first time, there's a lot of things that we see about them that we size up. So when we meet somebody, we might see the physicality of their person, how they talk, how they dress, uh, uh, fragrance, aroma, even the environment that we're around. All of those things communicate something about our perspective in life. If we want to be unique, if we want to make a mark in other people's lives and make an impression, where that's going to find the most value, again, is in how unique you are in that demonstration of communication. Be deliberate in the impressions that you're going to make. Those impressions may be there for a long time in somebody else's life. So if you're deliberate in the impressions that you make, then not only can you be remembered for what you've done, but you will be remembered by the person who you're making that impression on. What impressions are you making on the people in your life today? What are you doing to be deliberate in that impression? We've talked about see, we've talked about tell. Now, what about the ideas that other people have? What about integrating things that are, that are out there that maybe we'd like to make it part of our life? That's how you flow. Normally when I'm talking about flow, I'm talking about all of the different things that come into our life, all the stimuli that enter into our existence and become part of our experience. And then we take that in and make it part of us. But today I'm going to take a little bit different tack because this is about innovation, really. What are you going to do in order to make a, an impression on other people's lives in this age of uncertainty that we're in? How are you going to stand out? Well, going to a business model, there is uh, a number of different stages that we can go through. The very first stage of innovation are the innovators. These are what Malcolm Gladwell would call the outliers in the world. They're the ones who make a difference before anybody else realizes difference needs to be made. Then there's the early adopters, the visionaries who try to adopt what the innovators said and make it more profitable. Then you have the early majority. Those people are going, that's a great idea, Derek. I'm gonna go with that. This is fantastic. And then we're going to work with it. Then you have the late majority. Now, these folks are the ones who are a bit traditionalists and they da drag their heels. They don't want to adjust or adopt to new technologies. And last of all, you have the laggards. And they're the ones that say, what just happened? Did I miss something? So looking at this graph, looking at this bell chart, I, how many of you like graphs and bell charts. I know there's a few of you out there because they just they just go, oh, I love to communicate in graphs and bell charts. And boy, do I like numbers. Well, here, this, is, this is just for you. So if you look at the one, the innovators, that's only two and a half percent of the people out there that are innovators are in that category. If you really want to make a difference in people's lives, if you really want to stand out, you want to shoot for that innovator role. Because in that innovator role, you're saying to people, let me show you what I see as possible. And if you're not in the beginning in the innovators, why not get into the early adopters and say, I can see it. Let me run with it. What you want to avoid is that opposite end, the laggards, where it's, 
what happened? Did, did I miss something? Or let me get up my A-track. I can use it still. See, flowing is about bringing things in, innovation, and, and then trying to uh, make it yours. We, have, we live in a world where technology is rapidly charging forward. A year ago, who would have thought that we would have been having a conference like this online? Nine months ago, we wouldn't have thought about this. The technology that I'm using for creating this, this video, making it available for somebody who's not a graphic designer, that's available now. Where are we going? Are you going to be an innovator? Are you going to be an early adopter? Are you going to be an early majority, a late majority? Or are you going to be a laggard? With vision, you can take in what you see coming, and make it yours, innovate, and make a difference. Good, I like seeing over here. We got innovator, earlier adopter, am I Krishna? Um, well, thanks for the graphs. I'm glad you all like the, the, the images. Where and when will you adopt and adapt? In your life, in your business, in whatever you're going to be doing, where and when are you going to adopt and adapt? Now, I know some of you have been looking forward to this one. This is how you play. And we're about Believe it or not, we're about halfway through our, meet our, our session here. So we're going to do an activity. I want you to loosen up a little bit. Raise your hands up in the air. Okay, put your hands up in the air. Get ready. Get ready. Go with the flow. You ready? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're doing a twirly now. Doing a twirly. Oh. Whoa. 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 oh, man. 360. Oh, oh man. Oh. Oh. Just to let you know, if you weren't aware of that already, that's called playing. All right, so who says you can't have fun online? That was 36 seconds, about a minute or two minutes less than what you would do it on a regular one. What does play mean anyway? Well, I like to use a very broad view of play. Play can be playing a game like this young man is doing with his sister. It could be exploring your abilities and finding out what you're capable of doing. That's play. It, it could be doing something that's extraordinary, something out of what you normally would do, testing your boundaries. See, play isn't just about fun. Play is exploring, self-discovery, finding out what you're capable of doing. So if you want to be remembered, how you play is going to play a big part of that. What risks are you willing to take to play, to explore? If you stay in the same pattern all the time and you don't test your boundaries, that's going to become visible. So if you hear somebody speaking five years ago and they're still speaking the same way five years later and they haven't grown, they haven't played. They haven't been in a self-discovery mode where they're trying to find out what they're capable of doing. In order to be strategic in this, you need to take controlled risks. I, I get that. Not everybody has the same tolerance for risks. But whatever is your safety mechanism, the thing that you should be attempting to do is taking some risks play with ideas, play with possibilities, play with what you have fun with challenges. There's lots of things that you can do out there that will make things enjoyable for you and help you to become a better person. What is your tolerance for taking risks? Have you thought about it? Are you high risk type of person who's willing to jump out of planes? 
or go, what's that, parasailing? Or do you like to keep things tight and not and not branch out more than what is your, you know that you're capable of? Either way, you are taking risks. So why not take risks that will help to advance you? Why not take risks that you can have fun with at the same time? That being said, there are gonna be moments where you're gonna have emotions about how you take risks, how those risks are affecting you emotionally. And that's how you feel. How you feel is very important in terms of our roles as speakers, by the way. When we get ready to step in front of an audience, we might be terrified. We might be scared, timid, our hands might get all sweaty, but that shows up. It, it's demonstrated to the audience in one way or shape or another. But you may not be aware of the feelings that you're feeling. I, I, I've met people and I know people who, if I said, what are you feeling? They don't know how to identify that. So there's something called an emotion wheel, which is pretty handy for helping people to understand what they feel. And I'm going to drag a copy of this over to you so in the chat so that you could have it there as well. You can look, take a look at that. I'm losing my um, mouse here. So maybe at the end of this, I'll pass this on to you. But in the center of this are, the, are basic emotions. And then in the second tier are demonstrations of that. And then the third tier are more demonstrations uh, of how you, you feel. So uh, the basic ones are happy, surprised, uh, bad, fearful, angry, disgusted. Now that's good for helping you to identify. What if you want to identify how your audience or what you want your audience to perceive? Well, that's why I like to use the Pluchik emotion wheel because here it shows connectivity between different emotional states. And it's excellent if, you, if, you want to, if you're crafting a speech, for instance, and you want that speech to evoke a particular kind of emotion, you can use different evocative uh, triggers, if you would, to get the kind of response that you want. How do you be, how are you remembered? Let me say this right now. It's very clear. How are you remembered? By how you make people feel. How you make people feel is how you're going to be remembered. You make them feel valued and they're going to feel valued. Oh, cue music. Tell me how this music makes you feel. Over here. Tell me how what tell me what the music feels like to you. First one's almost over. I know we've been rushing through this. I'd just like to encourage you when it comes to feeling so that you can connect with your audience, connect with other people, is to invest the effort to appreciate your emotional state. If you know yourself well, you will get to know other people well as well. So get to know yourself well. I know for, for some of us, we've been going through this awful fast. There's a reason for that. This is my Jackson Pollock wand, my dad's paintbrush, and I'm flicking things as quickly as I can because I want to see what sticks. Next is how you be, all right? Now, I know how you be is not particularly good grammar, all right? I get that. But it's not how you are that is, I'm asking. It's how you be. What is this? What is the being of you? That is your value set. 
when you look into somebody's eyes, you've got to realize there's a whole life experience behind them that makes them who they are today. When your audience members connect with you, they're not just connecting with the speaker that's in front of them. They're connecting with everything that went into what you are. That's visible to the eyes. Why do you think at Toastmasters, by the way, that it's so important that we make eye contact with our audience? Because when we make eye contact with our audience, we have the opportunity to connect with them. And so if we're going back to the feel part about feeling and feeling not only our own emotions, but the emotions of those who are receiving our uh, communication. It's also important to be able to connect to who they are. What's going on? What contributed to the things that were in their life that made them what they are today? We are a complex people. We have a lot of things going on. And in that, you, 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 you just really want to connect with people. Uh, and this, this day and age right now, let's, let's be honest, it's, it's, it's challenging. We've been separated from one another. We have something called social distancing. And the reality is for us is that we weren't meant to be apart. We were meant to connect. And you know what? That connectivity is what makes us more valuable to others. When we connect with them and they are able to connect with us, something happens. A relationship builds. A camaraderie builds. Community builds. Something happens when we are ourselves and we can establish that as a common bond. I'm myself and you're yourself and together uh, we are unique. When you look in the mirror in the morning, what do you see? Who do you see? The confidence, timidity, timidity. I'm hoping that you're gonna see creativity. The question you ask in terms of your be or how you be is what is important to you? As adage, where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. So follow the things that are important to you when you're communicating, when you're building this creative you. Always be aware of what's important to you. Let people know that this is who I am. Before I started this session, I had this all scripted out. I was ready to just read from a script off of a teleprompter up there. And then I remembered this slide that I put in here, be yourself. I'm not a script guy. I'm not a script dude. I, I, I'm a Jackson Pollock paint flipper, right? So I would encourage you, whatever you're creating, be yourself. You can't be anything else. Lastly, and back to the very beginning of our session, I talked about what it takes to be a creative. To be a creative, you have to do. As things are going on in your heart or in your head, you really never demonstrate what you're created until you do something. That is how you are remembered. You have to do. If you want to be remembered by some action that you've done, some behavior, some something about you, you want that remembered, there has to be a demonstration of it. And in the creative process, there is no creative process unless it is being created and it's an action. Look, there's 7.8 billion people on the planet, right? That's a lot of people. How do you stand out in the middle of 7.8 billion people? Well, you don't. Don't expect to stand out in 7.8 billion people. Find your niche. Find the thing that is, find the place where you can make a difference. Instead of asking a lot of marketing questions right now, how important is it to ask questions like, how many others are in my demographic? What's the competition? Who cares what the competition? There's only one of you. In the big crowd out there, you don't need to touch all of them. You need to touch those who you can influence. 
You need to touch those who, who will gather around the message that you have or the communication of your understanding. Or another question that might be, but it, trust me, I like metrics. I like measurement. I know that they're necessary in business and everything else. But I wonder, is it also important to ask who makes up your audience? A lot of times I'm asked, who's my audience? Who's my target audience? And I go, I don't know who my target audience is. I guess it's anybody who wants to listen to the message. And the message is one of creativity and, and releasing people in their creativity. If you want to do, if you want to act, if you want to make a difference, do what's unique to you. I, I just want to, if I could point out just one thing that's worthy of noting when it comes to how you do, it's this one thing. Come on, hand, go down. Thank you very much. Go down now. Yeah. Okay. A creation is not a creation until it is manifest. The person that you're creating, the concept that you're creating, the speech that you're creating doesn't exist until other people can see it or hear it. In the obscurity of the shadows of all the people wandering around the earth, if you want to stand out to be bright, you need to stand out and be yourself. Look, anonymity is reserved for those who don't act. If you want to remain anonymous, just don't do anything. But if you want to celebrate your individuality and be you, gosh, have fun doing it. That is the key. Explore. Do all the things that you want to do that's going to make your experience enriched, enriched, enriched with so many things that other people want to share in. It's what you do is how you will be remembered. What you do is how you will be remembered. All right. That's the seven nudges, as I call them. We've been through a lot. I hope that you've enjoyed it so far. I'm just going to summarize very quickly with the things that we have uh, that we've covered. All right, we talked about how how it is to be. What is it? To, what is a creative? And then we went through seven processes of of creativity. There is how you see. That's how I uniquely interpret the world around me. How I create an understanding of that. That's how I see. It alters the way I view the world how I view myself, how I view the people in my life. How you see is critical for establishing a point of remembrance for those who are communicating with. After that, we looked at how you're going to take what you understand and then communicate that out to others. All right. So that's the tell, how you tell. I would love to be an a musician and an artist and a sculptor and a glass blower and a, uh, a dancer. I'm horrible at dancing, by the way, uh, but I would love to do all those things. But my primary way of communicating is with words. And for many of you, that will be the same way. Find the place where you're comfortable, where you're most comfortable and communicating what you understand. Find that place and be strong in it. By all means, use the things that are best practices, integrate things that other people do that work for you, flow with those. And then when you see things that are happening, when the visionary part of your mind begins to kick in, integrate those things. Be an early innovator or at least an early adopter of new things. There's a future out there that's bright and beautiful. Be optimistic about it and Pull that into the present and make it yours. And by all means, have some fun with it. Play with ideas. Once you get some things in, once you get some things in your life that you want to play with, some discoveries that you have, see how you can bend them, break them, stretch them. What are the boundaries of possibilities on what I have available to me? That is play and make the absolute most of it. Then we talked about feel, your emotions, how you become emotionally uh, connected to your creation. 
how other people can become emotionally connected to your creation. And, and what a wonderful discovery once you see that that creation is you. How do you feel about the creation of you that you're making? How do you feel about the creation that you're making in other people as you deposit something of you into their life? And then we have how you be. Look, no matter what happens in this world, no matter what uncertainty comes, no matter what adversity, no matter what the universe throws at you, you can only be you. You can't be somebody else. Knowing your value set, knowing your experience, knowing the things that contribute to who you are, it really is going to be a, an identifier that says, I am who I am. And I'd like to hear that from you as well. I am who I am. I can't be anything else. And lastly, we talked about do, how you do. If you're going to make a mark in somebody's life, you can't do it sitting in a room with nobody else around. You've got to get on online, uh, an online meeting, a chat room, uh, a blog. You've got to get in front of an audience. You, you've got to do something to do. So uh, that's why we encourage new members at Toastmasters to get up quickly and to do an introduction or do an icebreaker because it begins, it sets a benchmark for how they are going to move forward, how they're going to do. Look, creativity opens up a world view of things that are possible. It's going to take some risks at time. Sometimes it's going to look scary, but I'll tell you what, the view from the top is absolutely worth the take. That's it for me. I'm going to be turning this over to Lou Brown now, who's going to be doing some questions and answering. But you know what? I hope that you will enjoy your creativity. Thank you very much, Derek. Folks, feel free to unmute and give Derek a round of applause. I have to say, I am just so inspired. The presentation was incredible. Thank you so much, Derek. We really appreciate that. Wonderful. You're welcome, Lou. I had fun, man.